Welcome everyone. I hope uh, you can hear me well. I hope you have a great day today and uh, that you are you were able to resume your almost uh, normal daily activity this week for most of us. So really happy to have you. Really happy to have you uh, live with us. And for some of you that do uh, not are not able to free themselves for, for in order to be in, in, uh, with us live, well, we really uh, uh, welcome you too for this uh, recording. So today, the, the, the webinar is really my personal favorite. It's about healthy knee function. So we've been discussing all these uh, issues and biomarkers that can help us identify why our patient has pain or why he, he has a, a progression of a way or and so forth. But today, We'll see really how should the, the knee perform a no, normal gait, but also a normal way to absorb the impact, to stabilize itself, and to push up. It is it, it's really what we're looking for in order to re restore and reestablish the good function of the knee. So it's really going to be, I hope, extremely useful and practical, and hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as I did when preparing it and when the uh, study these things in fact. So we'll start. Just a reminder of uh, what we're, we're talking about. We're, we're talking about gait uh, and we're talking about movement. We're talking about three planes of motion, right? So the first plane of motion that we see on the left part of the screen is how the knee bends and expands during uh, a movement. Here we're talking about gait. So the more positive the numbers are, the more banded the knee is, so the more in the flex position, and the more towards zero you go, the more extended you are. In the middle graph, you see the frontal plane, which is, does the knee is really well aligned or does it go more into various or valgus alignment? And you have the zero, the more positive you go, the more best you are, and the more negative you go toward downwards, the more vulgus you're going to be. And lastly, you have the rotational plane or transfer plane. So again, you have the zero in the middle, and the more positive you go, the more external or lateral you go into rotation. And the more negative you go, obviously, you're the most internal rotation or the more uh, medial debilitation you are. So that's what we're going to look at is what, how should a normal task be performed for the knee. But also we'll do correlation about which muscle helps the, pa the patient do a normal movement or a normal task. So you see here just from this graph, uh, which is a, a contraction and synergy of the, the muscle recruitment during gait. First thing that strikes me is how you take the top of the graph and you have the, 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 the hip muscles, and then you have all the tight and the calf muscle and then the foot muscles. So you, you have all the lower limb muscle all together and, and you see that each of these muscles are going to participate at one point during a simple, simple task of gait. So the first thing that, comes to mind is that really looking at the task uh, with uh, as simple as walking can help us have a good idea of did we really restore the function of all these muscles and not only that but are they able to recruit at the right moment the right timing are they working well in synergy with the other muscles so we see that all these muscles have, very, have a very specific moment function in order to be functional and to activate and you you want them to activate at that moment but you also want them not to be engaged at the other moments if you see just the first one is the iliopsoas you don't want it to activate at any moment during the, the, the support phase and you want him to activate only during the push-up phase and then stop any other action would not be functional and would have impact on, on our patient, obviously. So 
So we'll look into a deeper dive into the synergistic and make sure that when we're gonna train our patient and make sure that when we're gonna give exercise, we're gonna be as much functional as we want, as we can, so that the patient does return to healthy uh, quality of life afterwards, right? Overview, this is not going to be too deep because we all know it almost by heart, right? But what we're talking about when we're talking about heel strike or initial contact is really the beginning of weight acceptance where you have at first no weight and then you start with the heel striking the ground. And the first thing that you want to do is have a loading response. You have to, you have to absorb the impact. So this is the first 10% of the gait. And it goes out almost up to 20% in order to finalize the weight acceptance. And then starts the stance phase where you did absorb the impact and you kind of just support yourself on one single link. And then you finish with obviously the push up phase where you already started on the other limb to accept the, the weight with the heel strike, right? And you kind of shift your weight from one limb to the other. And finally, the swing, you're, not, you're off the ground and bringing your foot forward. Sorry about that. Seems there's some kind of audio issue. I'll see what I can do on my side. Let me just see if I can maximize my microphone. Is it a little bit better? Uh, the best I can do, I think. Excellent. Thank you for letting me know. All right, let's jump into what's the most interesting. What should the knee do? So absorption phase might be the most crucial phase. When we walk, obviously, but also when we're going to do any sports that involve uh, weight bearing. So if you're gonna play soccer, football, if you're gonna hike, even when you're gonna ski or you're gonna you're gonna uh, run, all of these different sports involve some kind of absorption. And looking at the gait only can help you know is my patient comfortable at absorbing, but is he using the right muscle at the right timing in order to absorb the impact? and weight bearing. So you really have a snapshot on the absorption pattern or absorption technique that your patient has adapted. So what should the need perform? How should the need uh, perform a good absorption? Well, if you look at the flexion extension, you see that when you heel strike, you're under 10 degrees of deflection. So you can say that you're in, ex on, in an extended position you're not obviously locked at zero, but you are extended. And then as soon as you heel strike, you start bending your knee. So you're gonna absorb the impact primarily by bending your knee. This is the most motion that you wanna have. And you see that you have up to 15 degrees to have a, a healthy approach. It's exactly the same thing that when you, you jump, right? When you jump and you land, you wanna absolutely not keep your knee locked, but you want to bend your knee in order not for the joint to be overload and for the muscle to be properly engaged. So that's what, you, that's what you're looking for in any weight-bearing activity. And the other plane, what should I do? Well, you see here in the frontal plane, you could say that no matter what the alignment will be when you heel strike, you want to keep that alignment without increase. So you see, this is a real zoom in uh, vision that you have in one graph, but a healthy patient will heel strike maybe at one or two degrees. So really close to neutral, typically a little bit varus rather than a little bit bulgous. But if you heel strike at one degree, then you finish the loading response maximum at two. 
it's really no motion to 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 be really noticed in the frontal thing. And for that, you need to create stabilization, right? Because you don't want any collapse to, uh, towards bulges or towards varus. And this all starts with good muscle stability. Oh, a bit more movement in the transverse vein, though. If you go on the last graph, you see that you do have a motion. What is this motion about? Well, you start in, in an external to the rotation or a lateral to the rotation. Why? Well, it's only an anatomical, right? Because when you do have this external tibial rotation, well, sorry, when you do have this extension of your knee in order to heel strike and this ex extended position, you also have a screw home mechanism, which is a passive mechanism, right? Where you, when you extend your knee because of the length of the condyle, naturally the tibia is going to go toward external tibial rotation passive. So this is not a big motion. We're talking about less than four degrees, but still you're going to be in that position while, while heel striking. And as soon as you start bending your knee, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to unlock that screw home mechanism. So you're going to return towards zero. And that's what you see here on the healthy patient. It's unlocked and there's a small motion of around four degrees to go towards zero, but then stabilize close to zero, and not really into too much internal to the rotation. So again, that requires a lot of control. You want your tibia to do this motion of unlocking, but not be, not collapse and go into a rotation. You really want that to be stabilized in neutral position. Why? Well, because you're absorbing the whole impact, right? At this moment, the knee has to absorb up to five, six times. Even some studies say, depending on the sports you're going to do, it can go up to eight times your body weight. So if you're 100 pounds only, your knee, at the minimum, has to absorb every single step 500 pounds. So you want your knee to, to be in a neutrally aligned position in the frontal leg, but also to restore to return to, his, to a neutral alignment and transverse plane, having the tibia really well aligned with the femur so that the ACL can be properly engaged. We remember that, right? In order to, uh, to guide the translation of the, of the rolling of the femur on the tibia. You want also the meniscus to be well aligned so they can absorb of up to 70% of the impact. And also the tracking of the patella because the, the kneecap is going to enter that and that catching mechanism. So you want all of this to be well aligned in order to perform a, a, this absorption task. So obviously this requires a lot of control. What are, what are the muscle that needs to be retrained and comfortable during absorption? Well, we have the answer on that graph. There's three muscle groups. First one is to the hip, and it's the glutes muscle. So again, the glutes are, we know that the glutes are going to play a major role, and we do have uh, gluteus maximus, gluteus minimus, and gluteus medius all activated during absorption. So what's their role? Well, obviously they want to, we're shifting our weight from one leg to the other, so they have to start activating as soon as you heel strike so that the pelvic is going to be real stable but also for the femur to be stable so if you lack any stability you can either have a, a pelvic drop or you could also have a, a pelvic movement and too much and this obviously is going to change the femur line and that's where you're going to have maybe a very thrust or a valgus thrust so you're going to have a lack of control in the frontal plane. So first thing we learn here, we want to work the glutes and we want to restore the glutes, but has then they restored all of, has all the exercises that we've done in the, in the past weeks been effective uh, functionally? Well, you just have to look, take a look, deeper look at absorption. And if you see that everything is well stabilized, then you did a good job or the patient did a good job. And it's not just that he's good at exercise, 
but it also has restore this function. Interestingly though, the gluteus maximus, we will return to that, but it's just primarily and mostly his own role to be activated at alert. But we'll come back to that. Second group that is going to be active, obviously, it are the quadriceps. So the quadriceps, you see that, that the rectus femoris, but also the vastus inferior sciris and medialis are all activated during absorption. And it's logical, right? We are bending the knee, so they are going to be active in order to absorb the impact as Chuck absorbed it. But what do we learn about just introducing ourselves to that fact? Well, we learned that the quadriceps does a knee-centric job. And interestingly, if you look at the contraction here, we see that after the absorption, so after the first 20% of the gait, the quadriceps are going to be shut down, never to really turn again, but to prepare for heel strikes once again. So what do we learn? Well, we learned that their primary role is kind of plyometric, right? Where they're gonna eccentrically absorb the impact and then push a little bit backward, but that's it. They're not engaged during stance to push into extension. They're not engaged afterwards during push off and even during the, the, the swing. So their role, functional role in weight bearing sports and our activity is primarily eccentric. So we wanna keep that in mind. Well, I was, uh, it changed a little bit the way I worked with my patient because I changed my focus for all my patients that I wanted to be more functional and weight bearing activities. It was eccentric that we needed to be uh, comfortable and, and endurance. And, do it. and the third group that we want to look at are the dorsiflexor. So you see that the dor dorsiflexor are still going to be activated during absorption, and the primarily the stronger one is the fibula center, right? Why? Well, we know that well when we hill strike, we do have this foot drop, and you want to really control that foot drop so you, there's no clapping. And you want to really have a, uh, a good eccentric control again of these dorsiflexors. What's going to happen if you don't? Well, it took time and research for us to discover that, but it, it is linked, in fact, with the control of this internal or medial tibial rotation. So if you see an exaggerated internal tibial rotation during absorption, well, the muscle that can help you correct that are going to be those dorsiflexors. Because if the foot drop is uncontrolled and it really goes too fast and too fast paced, well, it's gonna bring the tibia with it and the, and the energy that has been, hasn't been controlled is going to, to take the tibia with it. So surprisingly, in a way for me, I was not gonna Think about it as a solution, but in fact, when we do retrain the eccentric control of these muscles, we do have a better stabilization of the internal rotation and we keep the tibia to be zero. So that was really a game changer for us and, and this fine tuning, and especially for our hikers or for a patient that has pain in the long term during long walking, these were the muscles that might explain why after a certain period of time, they lack endurance to do these tasks. Anyway, so we go back into more detail about these quadricep muscles. We see that they're, they're gonna be engaged with a co-contraction with the hamstring during heel strike. So at heel striking at zero, you do have the hamstring here on the second part of the graph that are activated to the maximum and then the quadricep that are highly activated too. So you do have a bracing for impact, just as you're gonna heel strike. And you need that synergy so that when your knee is gonna be almost in an extended position, he's gonna be comfortable not going back towards locking yourself into extension, but really heel striking in a controlled fashion. But as soon as you heel strike, what's, what is gonna happen is that your hamstring has to completely shut down. And you see that on the graph, right? And the first 10%, they're gonna go 
almost to zero. So you really want this these hamstring synergy with the with the quadricep to work together for a really short period of time and then let go of the quadricep to do their job. What's gonna happen if this is not been restored? Let's say we have an ACL patient who we did try to restore the equilibrium bump in between the hamstring and the quad. So have we, have we been successful or not? Well, if the patient is not comfortable with that synergy, he's gonna adapt a, a, a different strategy. He's gonna, for example, keep the knee bent and this, and this flexion, this dynamic flexion contracture, right? Because rather than having this difficult synergy from the hamstring to the quad, he's gonna just go a full co-contraction that he's gonna keep all the way through during absorption. And so he's gonna heel strike with the knee band and he's gonna keep the knee band all the way through. And this obviously, as we discussed, will have impact for the kneecap, the pain, even can develop a pet sensory syndromes, IT band syndromes kind of thing because of this co-contraction that's gonna be, that's gonna occur. And if the, the patient has not restored the, the, the um, capacity, the eccentric comfort level in order to absorb, he can also just keep his knee completely bent and fail to engage the quadricep whatsoever in an eccentric, an eccentric fashion. So he's gonna keep the knee locked in an extended position. And uh, this will reveal to us that the patient is not comfortable in eccentric Maybe after an ACL again, and he doesn't want to go and enter a drawer or something like that. So there, there's different strategy that can indicate to us that even though we did do some strengthening exercise, well, the patient is not yet at the functional level or the functional comfort that he should. Be. And lastly, when if we enter again ourselves to the glutes, especially the glutes maximus. For me, the glutes maximus has always been a hip extensor, and it is, right? So I thought, well, if, I, if he's gonna be a hip extensor, uh, if I see my patient fails to have hip extension during push-up, for example, I'm gonna work my glutes, right? But when going deeper into function, we see that the gluteus maximus is only activated at absorption and after he's shut down for all the rest of the gate never to be activated again before the next absorption. So what did I learn is that, well, if I'm gonna help the patient have a better hip extension and I'm gonna work with my glutes, well, it's never gonna work. And if I wanted my patient to have better push-up or more power of push-up and I work my glutes, it's completely useless. I was doing something that my patient cannot use because that's not the role and that's not the way they will lower limb function. So working with the glutes, yes, but understanding that his primary role is during absorption to stabilize the hip, maybe a little bit of hip extension also because it's kind of bringing the, 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 the hip from a flexion position towards a little bit the, the extension, but really that is the limit of what so for me, it was really eye-opening anyway. So following absorption, of, co of course, comes the stance phase. Stance phase is really a stabilization phase. And interestingly enough, when you're gonna treat runners, the stance phase kind of disappears. And there is no really stance. It's just a quick follow-up from absorption and the push-up. And there's no really pause in between. For it does reveal when we look at the gait, it does reveal to us how comfortable the patient is to stabilize himself and how comfortable the patient is to use all his muscle and synergy to have a proper ankle and hip stabilization. So we see that here uh, during stance, the patient has to go from this flex position that he adopted during absorption and go into extension again. Obviously, we're never gonna lock ourselves into hyperextension or completely extended position. That would reveal that we lack muscle activation. But we're gonna go 
uh, in an extended position. And the other plane and the frontal plane, again, very little movement. This is really zoomed in, but you're talking about a patient that would be in two degrees of varus, which is mostly neutral, and finish the stance into zero. So we have a small tendency to go a little bit towards bogus, but basically we stay neutral during stance. So again, really minimal movement. And during the, and the transverse plane, we see that during stance, there shouldn't occur any movement any excessive internal or external to go movement during stance would be abnormal. So what we, get, what we do basically during stance is just go back toward extension. So what muscle will help us perform that task? Well, we mentioned that we're going towards extension. So the most interesting for me is to see that one muscle is not engaged during stance, and these are the quadriceps. So the quads completely stop activating at 20%. So it means, if you look at the graph here, that you do the absorption, and when they, once they did their job of absorbing, a little bit of plyometry, maybe a little bit pushing, a little bit towards extension, but after they completely shut down, and the rest, the real extension movement, occurs without any quadriceps engagement. So what do we learn? Well, we learned that it's not currently a, an active movement that my patient has to do. It's really more that you have, that, you have absorbed the impact and then you're moving forward because of the push of the lower limb that you just, you just pushed. And then your body is shifting forward. And so just passively with your body moving forward, then you, your leg is going passively towards a, locking itself up and the extension. So what you have to do in fact is not push, but you have to refrain from having this knee locked and extend an extension, an upper extension. So what muscle do you need to do in order to limit the, the, the extension? Well, one might think, and I might have think in the past, you know, hamstrings are knee flexors, so maybe they can help, right? Keeping the knee not from preventing the knee going into extension. But again, looking at the, the, the science, you see that this none of the semi membranous or the bicep femoris are activated during stance. So which muscle helps you? Well, only the gastrocnemius. So the calf muscle, and primarily the gastric limb, is because the calf is attached on the femur, right? So it has a flexion capacity. And what he does is when you, you have the synergy from the quadricep going toward, pushing you towards extension and then passively going there, but the gastric nimbus are going to engage and slowly, eccentrically absorb the impact, slow you down, prevent the locking of the knee, with the help of uh, the popliteus too, and then I slowly push you back towards push up at the end of the stand. So very interesting role of the cat that we learn here. So what practical lesson do we learn from that? Well, if I see my patient keeping the knee band during the stance and I'm thinking, well, I'm gonna push his knee backward with more engagement of the quadriceps, well, I might fail. Or if I see my patient locking some in upper extension, I say, I want him to unlock his knee and I work on hamstring activation, I might not get. So what I wanna do is restore the calf activation. But even more so, I wanna make sure that even before that, I had a good absorption. Because if I do, I have a good absorption and then I have natural movement toward extension, this is the natural uh, synergy that we need in order for the quads to pass the, the, the power to the gastrocnemius muscle. So which muscle are going to be activated with the, the calf? Well, you have all the, if you go down from the graph, you have all the foot and ankle satellite. And it's logical, right? We are on one single limb. 
and we have all our weights on our foot and the ankle. So these muscle has to be really stable, really strong in order to keep, keep the tibia well aligned and not having this collapse. So if I do have a collapse, if I do have an internal tibial rotation during stance, most likely it's my ankle and foot stabilizer that has not activated. So we see that an internal tibial rotation, depending if it happens during loading, it's gonna be more dorsiflexor that does not do their job because you're still in the motion of the foot. But if once the foot is really on the ground, then you're really looking at the ankle and the foot stabilizer to do their job. And there's a second group that should do uh, perform a stabilization is the hip. The hip stabilizer, but interestingly not the glute maximus. But you do have the glute medius, the glute minimus, and one new one is the tensor of the fascial lap. Why? Well, these three muscles are in, in lateral of the hip, right? So they are going to you to be working in synergy because the other limb obviously is off the ground. And so you want your hip to be really, be really stabilized in order not to have any collapse or drop. So you need all these three muscles to work in synergy. So what practical lesson we learned from that? Well, if during stance, I see any collapse, well, this is where I'm gonna work primarily on my glute medius, glute med minimus as hip abductors, because these are the muscles that are going to do their job. So if I want to know, does my, again, my hip abduction exercise that I've been doing with my patient is not just, he's not just good at exercising them, and it's not just when he's thinking about it while going down the stairs, but really when he does a, a functional task, does he use them? Well, you can look at the frontal plane. Is my patient stable during stance? And other practical lesson, we didn't have any webinar about it, but we could talk about the IT band syndrome. So if for any reason there's a malalignment during, um, during stance, if, for example, you, I'm too much embarrassed or I push so passive pressure on the, the IT band, well, if this occurs during stance, when there's an activation of the tensor of the fasciolata, and there's also a passive pressure or tension because I'm too much embarrassed, then this is a, a, a good cocktail to overload my uh, ten, my, my, my or if the opposite occurs, where you're gonna see at another moment that the IT band is gonna be activated, let's say for push up, the, the IT band is activated or the tension of the facial ADA is activated, when you see that he should be only activated during stance, well, then you can have an overload because of an overuse, because of a non functional activation. So, the good way just in understanding when it should perform it the task and leads you to different conclusions. So just a deeper dive into the soleus and gastric nervous activation. So you see that the maximum peak activation is going to be at mid of the gait cycle, so during stance. And you see that you're going to really be engaging, activated, and in order to stop the knee from going into that extension completely, and then just enough to push it back, to unlock the knee to engage for the push up. So if this all that task has been well performed, then deep, these, that, they, this will lead to a proper push up. So what is a proper push up? Well, obviously you bend your knee. You're gonna bend your knee to the maximum that you're gonna do because you're going to the swing phase. But it's also the, the, the phase where you have the most motion in the outer planes, especially in the frontal plane. You see that you go from a neutrally aligned knee here. It's really zoomed in. I, 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 I want to emphasize that. So it seems a lot, but it's not that much. But you go from a neutral position towards a slightly positive position. So we're talking about around five degrees 
of, the, of emotion towards Vargas. Why do we do a Vargas movement? Well, it's somewhat functional, right? Because you don't really bring your foot perfect or your body perfectly forward as you walk, right? You go slightly towards your, the limb every time you walk. So moving your hip uh, and diagonal a little bit makes you go a little bit vagus. But again, this is five degrees, this is not a lot. You shouldn't have the impression that the knee collapses toward vagus. In, in truth, because the, the, the pelvic moves, maybe you, you won't even say that it's, it's vagus position with your bare eye. You, you'll have the impression that it stays stable all the way through because of that. So you have this small vagus, and then you have this a little bit of external tibial rotation. So classically, right, you just passively, because you go into a vagus, then the tibia being on weight bearing, you have passive external tibial rotation. So it's only natural that if you go a little bit in vagus, then you push a little bit of external rotation. So we're really talking about fine tuning and fine new movement here that you know, visually, you should have the impression that there is no movement. Because you're talking about external rotation of two degrees, two or three degrees, so really nothing. So this is the proper push-up. So which muscles should do their job in order to have a proper push-up? Well, like we said, all the calf muscle has to do with their job, and this leads to the next muscle to, do it, to take over. Which muscle takes over? Well, I was under the impression that it was going to be the hip flexor. So the hip flexor would be the one that will, you know, lift up following this foot push up. But in fact, it's the secondary, in my head anyway, the secondary hip flexor that engage. You see here on the top of the graph, the first muscle in chronologic order to engage are the rectus femoris and the adductor longus. So these are, these are the muscles that has, uh, you could say, stop being in an extended position and kind of unlock and bring it forward a little bit. And the adductor longus obviously helps with the knee going a little bit vagus. So what do we learn from that? Well, we learned that these muscles has a role, that's the first, and their primary role is going to go from an extended hip towards a neutral hip. But the second thing that we learn is we can think about our chronic anterior knee pain, chronic uh, tendinosis of the, 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 the quadriceps of the tendon. Why do we think about that? Well, because if it's really functional for the rectus femoris to be activated at that moment, you don't want it to be overactivated. How should that occur? Well, let's say, for example, that I didn't have a good calf recruitment during my stance. Maybe I, I didn't recruit the calf at all and I just went locking my knee in extension. So when I'm gonna push up, in fact, the calf has not done their, their push up. So I really find myself having to lift up. The first muscle that has to lift all the weight of this lower limb, this really, uh, this is a, a lot of weight to lift. So it's going to, first in line, is going to be the rectus femoris. That has to pull really hard. And at the end of this rectus femoris, you find the patella and the tendons. So be aware, if your patient tells you, well, I have my pain that push up. It's not so much as absorption, but really when I'm bringing my, my foot forward. Well, this is, a, this is a, a, red, a red flag that might indicate that the push up does not fix a normal place. Maybe the stance has not been performed well, the calf hasn't been engaged, or any reason makes the rectus femoris to engage too much. In some cases I have, been, I have seen also that it's the hip flexor are just too weak, so they don't take over after the rectus femoris. So the rectus femoris has to engage all the way. So it's a great thing that I did really found interesting when I was struggling to find a solution with these chronic pathologies. But in a, in a normal fashion, if the rectus femoris unlock, 
uh, you should have to perform a two difficult task because the push-up has, has occurred with the calf. He unlocks all of it, and then the hip flexor with the helium psoas, iliacus, and sartorius are going to take over and really bring the foot at the lower limb forward. And obviously, if you go more in the middle of the graph, you see all the dorsiflexors. So all the dorsiflexors will bring the foot off from the ground in order to bring it forward. What's going to occur if any of these muscles do not perform their job well? Well, if the hip flexor and the dorsiflexor are not strong enough or not activated enough, well, the, the patient is going to have to compensate in one way to the other to bring the foot forward. So he might go too much into a valgus, might go in the circumduction, or he might lean his trunk. Any reason that would indicate that the, the patient is not, uh, is not engaging these muscles properly to push up. And uh, one last thing about uh, this, uh, this push up is that you, you really want to make sure that if you do have a valgus collapse, so let's say I'm looking at my patient, I see the valgus is too much, is exaggerated. And I say, well, I know the solution. You're a valgus, I'm gonna train the glutes because valgus is corrected by glutes, right? Well, not right. Because interestingly enough, all the glutes had stopped working at 40% of the cycle. So even before mid cycle of the gait. So during the push-up phase, if you have a valgus and you work with the glutes, you're never gonna correct it. And you might find yourself saying, well, you know, working with the glutes doesn't work because the valgus is still there. Obviously it's still there because it's not functional. If you want to think of, of other things. Amongst other things that you wanna think about is the control lateral glutes. Why do we say that? Well, because during push-up, the other limb has started with acceptance and loading. So the other glutes should stabilize the hip. And if these fail to do it, well, the hip from these, from this lower limb that is uh, in, uh, the, in a in loading phase, if they fail to stabilize and you do have a pelvic drop, well, this limb that is pushing up might go more into valgus because of that. So you, you want to think about the, uh, the control of the glutes amongst other solutions. So very interesting to really, well, for me anyway, it was really eye-opening to understand the role and the limit of these specific muscle groups. We went through that. So last word about these iliopsoas is with the dorsiflexor acting at this moment. So the muscle acting during the push-up are amongst the only ones, in fact, that do perform a concentric test. So all of the other that we've seen so far are really eccentric or stabilizer. But these are really concentric doing their natural work that we would think of. But it's really the only phase where you see that. And finally, swing and heel strike. Well, obviously you go back in preparation for weight acceptance. The way you want to do in order to prepare for that? Well, obviously, you're going to extend your knee in order to have this good position, not banded, but really close to extension for heel striking. And the frontal plane, where you go back from this maximum valgus, this slight valgus that you had, and you'll do a motion to place your lower limb well in a good, proper alignment to have a functional filter. And lastly, you have a passive, this passive external or lateral debilitation. All the while you go into this extension, you'll also go slowly into this external extension. So again, this is four degrees, so it shouldn't be too much, but it's normal to see slowly the foot going and positioning himself at heel strike a little bit in external extension. But what would not be normal would be for you during the push-up to see the, the, the foot going out like this. 
it would be that rather than that the slow external rotation occurring slowly during the, the swing and reaching maximum at heel strike, the patient would have a drastic external or lateral tibial rotation during push-up. And at that moment, the knee is bending rather than extending. So it absolutely has no link with a screw home mechanism. It's really a movement toward external rotation. And that would indicate that the patient is pulling an external rotation in order to bring the foot forward uh, you, you know, in a compensation way. So that would lead to over recruiting of the bicep femoris, over recruiting of the tensor of the facial lata, because these are the two muscles that I keep in the bicep femoris that can pull the knee into external rotation. So these two muscles should never be activated during push up. So if you do have this kick during push up, it means that there's going to be an overload, especially if the patient starts engaging in higher level of sports, soccer, whatever call it, you want to call it, hiking, running. So this push-up technique will lead to risk of pain and overuse as well. That could be a factor. So which muscle we're going to occur during the, the end of the swing, preparation to the heel strike? Well, primarily, they're just the dorsiflexor that are going to finish their job. But also, very interestingly, we find our hamstring. So what do we learn? Well, we learned that the hamstring are not activated in a concentric fashion once again. So for me anyway, I don't know for you, but when I was thinking about my push-off, and I was thinking, well, I'm bending my knees during push-off, right? So if I'm gonna push, if I'm gonna bend my knee, well, my hamstring has to do something with that because they are knee flexor. Well, not at all. Because what's happening is that I'm pushing with my foot and I'm pulling with my hip flexor. So I'm bringing my femur towards, forwards, and then there's kind of this um, swinging of the tibia. So I'm, I'm in fact bringing my tibia forward like this. And I don't, at any moment, I don't need to bend my knee active. So what I'm gonna do instead is again, I'm gonna slow down this kind of swinging of my tibia, and I'm gonna slow it down in preparation for the heel strike. So I don't just go and completely lock myself in extension. So I'm gonna prepare for impact with engaging eccentrically my hamstring, and then finishing with a slight activation of the quads in order to have my good core cool contraction at heel strike. So what do I learn from that with my hamstring? Well, they're not activated at any moment during weight bearing, any moment during push up, and only in preparation for heel strike in an eccentric fashion. So, it really changed my mind the way I'm going to work in my hamstring to be more functional, but also to restore the synergy of the co contraction with the hamstring and the quadricep. That's really what they do. They work together. Maximum hamstring contraction, co-contraction, and then shutting down of the hamstrings. And also it reveals to me that if at any moment my patient feels the need to activate the hamstring, rather either it's during absorption, stance, or push-up, well, there is something wrong. And I'm, uh, my patient is maybe at risk of having overuse a Pessonserine syndrome tendinosis because of this overuse that is not functional. So again, for me, it was really eye-opening uh, and changed a little bit the way I was going to work with my patient. So what do we learn from all this? Well, key ideas. All lower limb muscles are contributing to engage. So that's marvelous because it means that just look at one single Eight, I can know, are my muscle, are my glutes muscle activated and stabilizing my hip properly and having a control of my femur? Are my quadriceps really comfortable 
go, doing an eccentric, an absorption, are my ankles stabilizing during their job, working at the right timing? Are my calf comfortable and eccentric motion and pushing me back? So all these answers can be found just looking at the gait because all these muscle has a role to do and you'll know depending on the motion and the, the compensation that your patient is going to show you if these muscles perform a proper uh, work. The second key idea is, is that lots of the muscle contractions are indeed eccentric. It's really about control and limiting movement, absorbing forces. So you see that when you get to retrain my patient and most of our daily activities and most of our sports, except maybe in some really sport specific patient, you want to really focus on that rather than the concentric pure strength. Uh, you want to really have an eccentric uh, if you're talking about uh, most of the muscle, and the exception being the dorsiflexor and the hip flexor. And the last key idea is that the knee function is the result of a multiple muscle. It's really a harmony, a fine tuned harmony, synergy with one another. What's the key idea? What's the lesson from that? We have to see a compensation. Let's see, you and me were looking at the patient and we'll see that he has a hip circumduction. Well, you cannot limit yourself about directing this hip circumduction because in fact, you want to think about the dominant effect. If the patient feels the need to do a hip circumduction during swing, is there something wrong with the push-up? Is there something wrong with the stance that hasn't activated the, the calf? Is there something wrong during the absorption that by, by all the triggering domino effect has not occurred properly, so I did not engage my, my, my quads, so my quads couldn't bring the power back to the calf, and the calf, the calf couldn't bring the power back to the hip flexor. So it's really a domino effect, and working with this will make us really more efficient at looking at the root causes when you want to be retrain your patient. So that might be a little bit overwhelming at first because it's so, well, anyway, for me, it was a little bit overwhelming. But what we do have, though, is some tools that we can, uh, that, we, that we use uh, daily with our partners. So I can, uh, I can try to just share with you uh, some tools that we, we developed from the literature that uh, really helped us having more um, comfort level. So I'm gonna share my screen up. So we do have these normative values about what should the knee do. And we also have these uh, graph about uh, what are the synergy occurring during the gait. So we kind of keep these cheat sheets and also another cheat sheet that indicate if I do have one bar markers, which muscle can fail to do their job properly. So having these cheat sheets, you know, slowly, daily, you really get comfortable at that. And you can really uh, bring your one step further into being more functional. Obviously, it all starts with having, you know, this, this skill, this assessment that you want to have and then once you're sure what the patient display as a bad function, then you can move forward with adapting your exercise. So this is gonna be the subject of the next webinar. The, and the last one, if we're gonna use these, uh, if we're gonna use these functional approach, we wanna make sure that our exercise are functional too. So which type of exercise can we use depending on what we found and our assessment? And we're going to try to walk you through that on the next one. So we, uh, I hope you really found that as interesting as I do and that it was as useful to you that it has been for us. And so I'll stay a little bit on. I, I know it's uh, three, uh, uh, it's uh, 12, 7, 1257, so you might want to hang up. 
but if you want to stay and open your microphone because you're a small group, then you're welcome to do so. And uh, uh, please also reach out to us if you want, info at movie.ca. We we'll want to engage the conversation. If you have other ideas, if there's something that I did wrong, I said wrong that you want to correct me or add to our knowledge, please share. We're always uh, here to learn more. So thank you very much, everybody.